The sea was wet as wet could be. By Gain Wilson I felt we made an embarrassing contrast to the open serenity of the scene around us. The pure blue of the sky was unmarked by a single cloud or bird, and nothing stirred on the vast stretch of beach except ourselves. The sea, sparkling under the freshness of the early morning sun, looked invitingly clean. I wanted to wade into it and wash myself, but I was afraid I would contaminate it. We are a contamination here, I thought. We're like a group of sticky bugs crawling in an ugly little crowd over polished marble. If I were God and looked down and saw us, lugging our baskets and our silly bright blankets, I would step on us and squash us with my foot. We should have been lovers or monks in such a place, but we were only a crowd of bored and boring drunks. You were always drunk when you were with Carl. Good old, mean old Carl was the greatest little drink-pourer in the world. He used drinks like other types of sadists use whips. He kept beating you with them until you dropped or sobbed or went mad and he enjoyed every step of the process. We'd been drinking all night, and when the morning came, somebody, I think it was Mandy, got the great idea that we should all go out on a picnic. Naturally, we thought it was an inspiration. We were nothing if not real sports, and so we'd packed some goodies, not forgetting the liquor, and we'd piled into the car, and there we were, weaving across the beach, looking for a place to spread our tacky banquet. We located a broad, low rock, decided it would serve for our table, and loaded it with the latest in plastic chinaware, a haphazard collection of food, and a quantity of bottles. Someone had packed a tin of Spam among the other offerings, and when I saw it, I was suddenly overwhelmed with an absurd feeling of nostalgia. It reminded me of the war, and of myself, soldier boying up through Italy. It also reminded me of how long ago the whole thing had been and how little I'd done of what I'd dreamed I'd do back then. I opened the spam and sat down to be alone with it and my memories, but it wasn't to be for long. The kind of people who run with people like Carl don't like to be alone, ever, especially with their memories, and they can't imagine anyone else might, at least now and then, have a taste for it. My rescuer was Irene. Irene was particularly sensitive about seeing people alone, because being alone had several times nearly produced fatal results for her. Being alone and taking pills to end the being alone. "'What's wrong, Phil?' she asked. "'Nothing's wrong,' I said, holding up a forkful of the pink spam in the sunlight. "'It tastes just like it always did. They haven't lost their touch.' She sat down in the sand beside me, very carefully, so as to avoid spilling the least drop of what must have been her millionth scotch. Phil, she said, I'm worried about Mandy. I really am. She looks so unhappy. I glanced over at Mandy. She had her head thrown back, and she was laughing uproariously at some joke Carl had just made. Carl was smiling at her, with his teeth glistening, and his eyes deep down dead as ever. Why should Mandy be happy, I asked. What, in God's name, has she got to be happy about? Oh, Phil, said Irene. You pretend to be such an awful cynic. She's alive, isn't she? I looked at her and wondered what such a statement meant, coming from someone who'd tried to do herself in as earnestly and as frequently as Irene. I decided that I did not know, and that I would probably never know. I also decided I didn't want any more of the spam. I turned to throw it away, doing my bit to litter up the beach, and then I saw them. They were far away, barely bigger than two dots, but you could tell there was something odd about them, even then. "'We've got company,' I said. Irene peered in the direction of my point. "'Look, everybody,' she cried. "'We've got company!' Everybody looked, just as she had asked them. "'What the hell is this?' asked Carl. "'Don't they know this is my private property?' And then he laughed. Carl had fantasies about owning things and having power. Now and then he got drunk enough to have little flashes of believing he was king of the world. "'You tell him, Carl,' said Horace. Horace had sparkling quips like that for almost every occasion. He was tall and bald, and he had a huge Adam's apple, and, like myself, he worked for Carl. I would have felt sorrier for Horace than I did if I hadn't had a sneaky suspicion that he was really happier when groveling. 
He lifted one scrawny fist and shook it in the direction of the distant pair. "'You guys better beat it,' he shouted. "'This is private property.' "'Will you shut up and stop being such an ass?' Mandy asked him. "'It's not polite to yell at strangers, dear, and this may damn well be their beach for all you know.' Mandy happens to be Horace's wife. Horace's children treat him about the same way. He busied himself with zipping up his windbreaker, because it was getting cold and because he had received an order to be quiet. I watched the two approaching figures. The one was tall and bulky, and he moved with a peculiar swaying gait. The other was short and hunched into himself, and he walked in a fretful zigzag line beside his towering companion. "'They're heading straight for us,' I said. The combination of the cool wind that had come up and the approach of the two strangers had put a damper on our little group. We sat quietly and watched them coming closer. The nearer they got, the odder they looked. "'For heaven's sake,' said Irene, "'the little one's wearing a square hat.' "'I think it's made of paper,' said Mandy, squinting. "'Folded newspaper.' "'Will you look at the mustache on the big bastard?' asked Carl. "'I don't think I've ever seen a bigger bush in my life.' "'They remind me of something,' I said. The others turned to look at me. "'The walrus and the carpenter.' "'They remind me of the walrus and the carpenter,' I said. "'The who?' asked Mandy. "'Don't tell me you've never heard of the walrus and the carpenter,' asked Carl. "'Never once,' said Mandy. "'Disgusting,' said Carl. "'You're an uncultured bitch. "'The walrus and the carpenter are probably two of the most famous characters in literature. "'They're in a poem by Lewis Carroll in one of the Alice books.' "'In Through the Looking Glass,' I said and then I recited their introduction. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. Mandy shrugged. Well, you'll just have to excuse my ignorance and concentrate on my charm, she said. I don't know how to break this to you all, said Irene, but the little one does have a handkerchief. We stared at them. The little one did indeed have a handkerchief a huge handkerchief, and he was using it to dab at his eyes. "'Is the little one supposed to be the carpenter?' asked Mandy. "'Yes,' I said. "'Then it's all right,' she said, "'because he's the one that's carrying the saw.' "'He is. So help me God,' said Carl. "'And to make the whole thing perfect, he's even wearing an apron.' "'So the carpenter in the poem has to wear an apron, right?' asked Mandy." Carol doesn't say whether he does or not, I said, but the illustrations by Tennille show him wearing one. They also show him with the same square jaw and the same big nose this guy's got. They're goddamn doubles, said Carl. The only thing wrong is that the walrus isn't a walrus, he just looks like one. You watch, said Mandy. Any minute now he's going to sprout fur all over and grow long fangs. Then, for the first time, the approaching pair noticed us. It seemed to give them quite a start. They stood and gaped at us, and the little one furtively stuffed his handkerchief out of sight. "'We can't be as surprising as all that,' whispered Irene. The big one began moving forward, then, in a hesitant, tentative kind of shuffle. The little one edged ahead, too, but he was careful to keep the bulk of his companion between himself and us. First contact with the aliens,' said Mandy." and Irene and Horace giggled nervously. I didn't respond. I had come to the decision that I was going to quit working for Carl, that I didn't like any of these people about me, except maybe Irene, and that these two strangers gave me the honest creeps. Then the big one smiled, and everything was changed. I've worked in the entertainment field, in advertising and in public relations, this means I have come in contact with some of the prime charm boys and girls in our proud land. I have become, therefore, not only a connoisseur of smiles, I am a being equipped with numerous automatic safeguards against them. When a talcumed smoothie comes at me with his brilliant ivories exposed, it only shows he's got something he can bite me with, that's all. But the smile of the walrus was something else. The smile of the walrus did what a smile hasn't done for me in years. It melted my heart. I used the cornball phrase very much on purpose. 
When I saw his smile, I knew I could trust him. I felt in my marrow that he was gentle and sweet and had nothing but the best intentions. His resemblance to the walrus in the poem ceased being vaguely chilling and became warmly comical. I loved him as I had loved the teddy bear of my childhood. Oh, I say, he said, and his voice was an embarrassed boom. I do hope we're not intruding. I dare say we are, squeaked the carpenter, peeping out from behind his companion. The, um, fact is, boomed the walrus, we didn't even notice you until just back then, you see. We were talking, is what, said the carpenter. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. About sand? I asked. The walrus looked at me with a startled air. We were, actually, now you come to mention it. He lifted one huge foot and shook it so that a little trickle of sand spilled out of his shoe. The stuff's impossible, he said. Gets in your clothes, tracks up the carpet. Ought to be swept away, it ought, said the carpenter. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? It's too much, said Carl. Yes, indeed, said the walrus, eyeing the sand around him with vague disapproval. Altogether too much. Then he turned to us again, and we all basked in that smile. Permit me to introduce my companion and myself, he said. You'll have to excuse George, said the carpenter, as he's a bit of a stuffed shirt, don't you know? Be that as it may, said the walrus, patting the carpenter on the flat top of his paper hat. This is Edward Farr, and I am George Tweety, both at your service. We are, um, both a trifle drunk, I'm afraid. We are indeed, we are that. As we have just come from a really delightful party, to which we shall soon return. Once we have found the fuel, that is, said Farr, waving his saw in the air. By now he had found the courage to come out and face us directly. "'Which brings me to the question,' said Tweedy. "'Have you seen any driftwood lying about the premises? "'We've been looking high and low, and we can't seem to find any of the blasted stuff.' "'Thought there'd be piles of it,' said Farr. "'But all there is is sand, don't you see?' "'I would have sworn you were looking for oysters,' said Carl. "'Again Tweedy appeared startled. "'O oh, oysters, come and walk with us.' the walrus did beseech. Oysters? he asked. Oh, no, we've got the oysters. All we lack is the means to cook em. Course we could always use a few more, said Farr, looking at his companion. I suppose we could at that, said Tweedy, thoughtfully. I'm afraid we can't help you fellows with the driftwood problem, said Carl, but you're more than welcome to a drink. There was something unfamiliar about the tone of Carl's voice that made my ears perk up. I turned to look at him, and then had difficulty covering up my astonishment. It was his eyes. For once, for the first time, they were really friendly. I'm not saying Carl had fishy eyes, blank eyes, not at all. On the surface, that is. On the surface, with his eyes, with his face, with the handling of his entire body, Carl was a master of animation and expression. From sympathetic, heartfelt warmth, all the way to icy rage, and on every stop in between, Carl was completely convincing. But only on the surface. Once you got to know Carl, and it took a while, you realized that none of it was really happening. That was because Carl had died, or been killed, long ago. Possibly in childhood. Possibly he had been born dead. So under the actor's warmth and rage, the eyes were always the eyes of a corpse. But now it was different. The friendliness here was genuine, I was sure of it. The smile of Tweedy, of the walrus, had performed a miracle. Carl had risen from his tomb. I was in honest awe. "'Delighted, old chap,' said Tweedy. They accepted their drinks with obvious pleasure, and we completed the introductions as they sat down to join us. I detected a strong smell of fish when Tweedy sat down beside me, but, oddly, I didn't find it offensive in the least. I was glad he'd chosen me to sit by. He turned and smiled at me, and my heart melted a little more. It soon turned out that the drinking we'd done before had only scratched the surface. Tweedy and Farr were magnificent boozers, and their gusto encouraged us all to follow suit. 
We drank absurd toasts, and were delighted to discover that Tweedy was an incredible raconteur. His specialty was outrageous fantasy, wild tales involving incongruous objects, events, and characters. His invention was endless. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. We laughed and drank and drank and laughed, and I began to wonder why in hell I'd spent my life being such a gloomy, moody son of a bitch, been such a distrustful and suspicious bastard, when the whole secret of everything, the whole core secret, was simply to enjoy it, to take it as it came. I looked around and grinned, and I didn't care if it was a foolish grin. Everybody looked all right. Everybody looked swell. Everybody looked better than I'd ever seen them look before. Irene looked happy, honestly and truly happy. She too had found the secret. No more pills for Irene, I thought. Now that she knows the secret, now that she's met Tweety, who's given her the secret, she'll have no more need of those goddamn pills. And I couldn't believe Horace and Mandy. They had their arms around each other, and their bodies were pressed close together, and they rocked as one being when they laughed at Tweety's wonderful stories. No more nagging for Mandy, I thought, and no more cringing for Horace, now that they've learned the secret. And then I looked at Carl laughing and relaxed and absolutely free of care, absolutely unchilled, finally, at last, after years of... And then I looked at Carl again. And then I looked down at my drink, and then I looked at my knees, and then I looked out at the sea, sparkling, clean, remote, and impersonal. And then I realized it had grown cold, quite cold, and that there wasn't a bird or a cloud in the sky. The sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud, because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. That part of the poem was, after all, a perfect description of a lifeless earth. It sounded beautiful at first. It sounded benign. But then you read it again, and you realized that Carol was describing barrenness and desolation. Suddenly Carl's voice broke through, and I heard him say, Hey, that's a hell of an idea, Tweety. By God, we'd love to, wouldn't we, gang? The others broke out in an affirmative chorus, and they all started scrambling to their feet around me. I looked up at them, like someone who's been awakened from sleep in a strange place, and they grinned down at me like loons. Come on, Phil, cried Irene. Her eyes were bright and shining, but it wasn't with happiness. I could see that now. It seems a shame, the walrus said to play them such a trick. I blinked my eyes and stared at them, one after the other. Old Phil's had a little too much to drink, cried Mandy, laughing. Come on, old Phil, come on and join the party. What party? I asked. I couldn't seem to get located. Everything seemed disoriented and grotesque. For Christ's sake, Phil, said Carl, Tweedy and Far here have invited us to join their party. There's no more drinks left, and they've got plenty. I set my plastic cup down carefully on the sand. If they would just shut up for a moment, I thought, I might be able to get the fuzz out of my head. Come along, sir, boomed Tweedy jovially. It's only a pleasant walk. O oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, along the briny beach. He was smiling at me, but the smile didn't work any more. You cannot do with more than four. I told him. Um, what's that? We cannot do with more than four, to give a hand to each. I said, you cannot do with more than four. He's right, you know, said Far the carpenter. Well, um, then, said the walrus, if you feel you really can't come, old chap. What in Christ's name are you talking about? asked Mandy. He's hung up on that goddamn poem, said Carl. Lewis Carroll's got the yellow bastard scared. Don't be such a party pooper, Phil, said Mandy. To hell with him, said Carl, and he started off, and all the others followed behind him, except Irene. Are you sure you really don't want to come, Phil? she asked. She looked frail and thin against the sunlight. I realized there really wasn't much of her, 
and that what was there had taken a terrible beating. No, I said, I don't. Are you sure you want to go? Of course I do, Phil. I thought of the pills. I suppose you do, I said. I suppose there's really no stopping you. No, Phil, there isn't. And then she stooped and kissed me, kissed me very gently, and I could feel the dry, chapped surface of her lips and the faint warmth of her breath. I stood. I wish you'd stay, I said. I can't, she said. And then she turned and ran after the others. I watched them growing smaller and smaller on the beach, following the walrus and the carpenter. I watched them come to where the beach curved around the bluff, and watched them disappear behind the bluff. I looked up at the sky. Pure blue. Impersonal. What do you think of this? I asked it. Nothing. It hadn't even noticed. Now if you're ready, oysters dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a, a dismal thing to do. A dismal thing to do. I began to run up the beach, toward the bluff. I stumbled now and then because I had had too much to drink, far too much to drink. I heard small shells crack under my shoes, and the sand made whipping noises. I fell, heavily, and lay there, gasping on the beach. My heart pounded in my chest. I was too old for this sort of footwork. I hadn't had any real exercise in years. I smoked too much, and I drank too much. I did all the wrong things. I didn't do any of the right things. I pushed myself up a little, and then I let myself down again. My heart was pounding hard enough to frighten me. I could feel it in my chest, frantically pumping, squeezing blood in and spurting blood out, like an oyster pulsing in the sea. Shall we be trotting home again? My heart was like an oyster. I got up, fell up, and began to run again, weaving widely, my mouth open and the air burning my throat. I was coated with sweat, streaming with it, and it felt icy in the cold wind. Shall we be trotting home again? I rounded the bluff, and then I stopped and stood, swaying, and then I dropped to my knees. The pure blue of the sky was unmarked by a single bird or cloud, and nothing stirred on the whole vast stretch of the beach. But answer came there none, and this was scarcely odd, because... Nothing stirred, but they were there. Irene and Mandy and Carl and Horace were there, and four others, too, just around the bluff. We cannot do with more than four. But the walrus and the carpenter had taken two trips. I began to crawl toward them on my knees. My heart, my oyster heart, was pounding too hard to allow me to stand. The other four had had a picnic, too, very like our own. They, too, had plastic cups and plates, and they, too, had brought bottles. They had sat and waited for the return of the walrus and the carpenter. Irene was right in front of me. Her eyes were open and stared at, but did not see the sky. The pure, blue, uncluttered sky. There were a few grains of sand in her left eye. Her face was almost clear of blood. There were only a few flecks of it on her lower chin. The spray from the huge wound in her chest seemed to have traveled mainly downward and to the right. I stretched out my arm and touched her hand. Irene, I said. But answer came there none, and this was scarcely odd, because they'd eaten every one. I looked up at the others. Like Irene, they were, all of them, dead. The walrus and the carpenter had eaten the oysters and left the shell. The carpenter never found any firewood, and so they'd eaten them raw. You can eat oysters raw if you want to. I said her name once more, just for the record, and then I stood and turned from them and walked to the bluff. I rounded the bluff, and the beach stretched before me, vast, smooth, empty, and remote. Even as I ran upon it, away from them, it was remote.